Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the PNYA Green Committee's latest event, the process of recycling. Um, today, we will lift the veil on how recycling works and what actually can be recycled, always a mystery to me. Um, I'd like to welcome Kara Napolitano. She heads up education and outreach for SEMS uh, Municipal Recycling Plant. And she's gonna walk us through kind of the large, it is the largest recycling facility in the US and it processes 100% of New York City's finest recycling. Um, Kara, thank you for joining us. And what we're gonna do, just a heads up, is she is gonna do her presentation for um, 45 minutes and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. Uh, if you don't have questions, pay attention everyone. We're so happy to have you, Kara. Great. Happy to be here. Um, great to, always great to be asked to present about recycling. I love explaining how this process works. So please um, do ask your questions. I, I think, are, are they to put their questions in the chat or just hold for the end? Uh, Whichever you want. But do, do remember your questions, do be sure to ask them at the end and hopefully I will answer many of them as I go. So my name is Karen Napolitano. I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator for Sims Municipal Recycling. This is an aerial of our facility. You can see we are located right on the waterfront. We are in Sunset Park, Brooklyn on an 11 acre pier. So it's a very large facility. You can see we have very large buildings. I will show you what happens inside all of them. But I do like to pause here just to point out two things. So first you can see on top of this very large building, it's called our tipping floor. We'll see the inside of that shortly. But on the roof, we have solar panels. So this is actually one of Brooklyn's largest solar arrays. Uh, it can on a sunny day power up to 12 and a half percent of our facility. Uh, and then of course, what you probably noticed here and what you'll see again uh, is our wind turbine. So this was the first commercial scale wind turbine, meaning big wind turbine installed in the five boroughs in New York City. Um, on a windy day, it can power up to two and a half percent of our facility. So I like to say on the sunniest, windiest day, uh, we can be run by up to 15 percent renewable energy. So and of course, oh yes, we get this lovely view of downtown Manhattan from our waterfront facility as well. So nice, nice spot. I definitely hope when the world reopens and when it is safe that you can all come and visit in person. Because yes, it is a recycling facility, but it's actually a very lovely place to visit, I think. So Sims Municipal Recycling, that is our company name. But the type of facility we are is what's called a material recovery facility, uh, also known as a MRF. So a MRF uh, is actually a very common type of facility. MRFs exist around the country. MRFs exist around the world. And the job of a MRF, Material Recovery Facility, which I also think is a very fun acronym, MRF, MRF, MRF. But the job of a MRF is to sort recyclables. That is what we do at this facility. We are not cleaning New York City's recyclables. We are not turning the recyclables into new things. That all happens in the next step. The job of the MRF is to sort. So at this MRF, Sims Municipal Recycling, located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, our job is to receive, sort, and sell New York City's recyclables. But there are a couple of details that I like to add to that. So first, I just like to make clear that we only receive recyclables at this facility. So anything that was placed into the trash even if it was a recyclable, if it was placed into a trash bin and left out in a trash bag for trash collection, it is not coming to us. We only receive things that were placed into recycling bins and properly left out for recycling collection. Additionally, we only receive recyclables from homes and public schools and some city agencies. And that just gets into how New York City organizes its waste collection. So each city does this differently. And in New York City, uh, the Department of Sanitation, the city agency that manages city waste, they collect trash and recyclables from homes, uh, public schools, some city agencies, some private schools. But businesses, office buildings, restaurants, stores have to hire what's called a private carter or a private hauler to collect their waste and collect their recyclables. So those recyclables don't come to Sims. 
but they do go on a journey similar to what I will talk you through this, this evening. So only recyclables and only from homes in public schools, but even with that little limitation, we are still receiving a thousand tons of materials each day. And that is a lot as far as MRFs go. Let me tell you that is a very small portion of all the waste that New York City creates every day. Happy to give you those numbers later if someone wants to be overwhelmed by all the trash we create, but a thousand tons of materials a day that number actually makes us the largest MRF in the country. And I will say, possibly, I've recently learned, it sounds like we are also the largest MRF in the world by volume, by the sheer volume of materials we receive uh, and process. So here you can see our whole 11 acre pier. Again, you can see the panels, you can see um, the turbine, and you can also see all of these barges tied up on the side of our facility. So that's actually a main way that we move recyclables through the city. Generally, if New York City can avoid using trucks to move waste or recycling, then the city will choose to do so. If you can opt for rail cars or barges over trucks, that's the choice that's going to be made. So here we are down in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. That's our, our main MRF, right? Our big, largest material recovery facility in the country, this big orange dot. So because we are receiving recyclables from all of New York City, instead of trucks, you know, driving all the way to us from the Bronx or Queens or Upper Manhattan, those trucks will drive to one of our transfer facilities here in Long Island City or here in Hunts Point. The trucks unload recyclables, the recyclables are loaded onto a barge, and the barge continues down the East River to us in Sunset Park. So by doing that, we are cutting down on about 100,000 miles worth of truck traffic each year, uh, sometimes even more than that. Um, so again, when possible to use barges or rail, the city will choose to do so. And this little blue dot, that's actually another MRF operated by Sims, but smaller, that processes Staten Island and Lower Manhattan's recyclables. All right, so it's a little bit about Sims, how we operate, but now I like to look at the bigger picture and just show you what is this entire process of recycling? Who are the key players in that process? So I've already told you what a MRF does. A MRF sorts. The MRF then sells materials to the appropriate reprocessor. So metals go to a smelter. Plastics go to what's called a plastic reclaimer. Paper goes to a paper mill. Glass goes to a glass plant and a furnace and so on. So in this red dot down here, that step in the process is really where the materials are prepared to be something new. That isn't necessarily when they're fully made into that new thing. They're just being prepared to be a new product. That next step though, when the materials are bought by a brand or a manufacturer, that is that very, very important step where the materials actually are used in products or packaging or, or what have you. And I like to stress that step in the process because we don't always think about it when we're putting a recyclable into the bin. We don't always think about the fact that someone has to buy this and use it in their products or packaging. And if no companies want to do that, then that item is, is it really as good as trash. There has to be some sort of demand, some sort of value for an item to actually be truly recyclable. So hopefully the item is bought by a brand. They use it in their products or packaging. They are sold back to the consumer who hopefully has the ability to recycle that item once again, at which point it will be collected by whoever's job it is to pick up your waste. Maybe it's your municipality. Remember in New York City, we have the Department of Sanitation of New York City, DSNY. They happen to be the largest sanitation department in the world, actually. We have a lot of biggest in the world here in New York City, but they will collect your recyclables and then bring them to a MRF. And then the journey continues. And that is the journey if all goes well. Of course, there are many potential barriers within that journey, but if all things are in place, that's how the recycling process will go. So 
Now I like to kind of break that down and don't worry, I'm going to show you some cool videos of the inside of the facility for soon, but I cannot do these tours without reviewing what we actually put in the recycling bins in New York City. Um, is anyone from outside of New York City or are we all in the five boroughs? Some are outside of New York City, great. So I will also touch on um, kind of common trends because in New York City, we do tend to recycle it. We recycle a wider range of materials than some other um, recycling programs. So I'll, I'll tell you what we do in New York City and then I'll tell you wider trends that are going to apply to multiple locations. So first thing, in New York City, we separate our recyclables into two bins. Right, we have this blue bin and we have this green bin. And look, they don't have to be blue and green in your house, but they just should be labeled. So you know you know what to put in them. Uh, they can be any color you want, just make sure you label them so it's clear what you should be putting in there. So many recycling programs have only one bin where all recyclables go into the same bin. So that's the first thing that sets New York City apart from many other recycling programs. Why do we have two bins and many other places have one bin? Lots of reasons. Um, one reason being in New York City, wow, it's a lot of stuff we receive a lot of recyclables. So separating them into two bins just makes it a little easier for us to process it at the MRF. Um, having residents separate paper, that's what that green bin is for, into another bin, it just makes our job actually a lot, a lot easier. It saves the city money, it saves us money, and that paper stays a lot cleaner. So one upside of having one bin is it's simpler. So maybe you'll get more stuff, right? You just put it all in one bin. But one downside is if the metal and the glass and the plastic items in that bin are kind of dirty, they're gonna make the paper really dirty. This paper is kind of a, a delicate material. So in New York City, it's just a couple of reasons we remain as what's called a dual stream recycling program. So in the blue bin, four types of materials, metal. And in New York City, you can recycle anything that's mostly metal from the very small bottle cap or old key to the very large refrigerator. You just have to have the, the coolant removed and the Department of Sanitation will do that for you. But look, anything that's metal in New York City, you may recycle it. Many programs though, want only soda cans and tin cans. Those are the surefire items that if you have a recycling program, you can recycle soda cans and tin cans. And then some programs will take aluminum foil, some won't. Some programs will take these aerosol cans if they're empty, some won't. Those are kind of the gray area items. But all places, soda cans, tin cans, New York City, everything. That is not, I mean, there's a pot on here. There's aluminum trays and aluminum foil, filing cabinet, everything. So glass is a bit more limited. As far as glass, you can only recycle bottles and jars. And that's going to be true in basically every recycling program that accepts glass. They only want bottles and jars. Why? Why? Because the companies buying the glass from us, can you maybe guess what they are making? making bottles and jars. So that's the type of glass that they need, right? They can't be mixing ceramic. No, different type of glass. Even certain drinking glasses, or especially things like Pyrex, like heat resistant glass or coffee pots, mm, different type of glass cannot be mixed with the bottles and jars. So bottles and jars only in pretty much, again, all recycling programs that accept glass. So Next item, cartons. Cartons, we take them in New York City, but a lot of programs, they don't want cartons. It's a complicated item. And also a lot of New Yorkers are like, wait a minute, it's paper. Shouldn't it go with the paper? No, because it is paper, but it's coated in plastic. So it's, you can't process it like paper. It's actually a contaminant. All that plastic causes problems if it ends up with the paper. So we put cartons in the blue bin. And then they have to go through this kind of complicated process to remove all these different layers of materials. So that's one reason that some programs don't even take cartons. They're kind of hard to reprocess. But in New York City, blue bin. 
And then last item, rigid plastic. In New York City, you may recycle any hard plastic. So the way I define that, the way I explain it to the kids is any plastic that keeps its shape when you set it on the counter, right? It doesn't just deflate. So things like plastic bags. No, things like a chip bag or a candy wrapper. No, so any, you know, actually what a, a very smart kid taught me is if it's plastic and you can smash it, you should trash it. These are things that don't belong in the recycling bin. And maybe some of you are familiar with ways to recycle um, plastic bags or plastic shopping bags, or even, <laughs> even the mailing envelopes. You can take these soft plastics back to certain stores and they do have bins for recycling soft plastic or plastic bags, like Target does it, Stop and Shop does it, Walmart, if you live near a Walmart, Bed Bath & Beyond, larger stores will often have bins for that. But these things everywhere in the United States, these things do not belong in your home recycling bin, the softer plastics. Uh, and many, last thing I'll say about plastics, many programs, outside of New York City only want bottles and jugs. So that would be on this picture, the water bottle that you see here, and then the jugs, like the milk jugs or the detergent jugs. Those are the plastics with kind of the strongest market. Remember, the most companies wanna buy them. So if you're not in New York City, good chance that you can at least recycle all water bottles, soda bottles, and all jugs, definitely. All right, that's a blue bin, that's a big one. It gets simpler from here on out. The green bin, paper and cardboard. That's it, paper and cardboard. If you can rip it, you can recycle it. Yes, there is a pizza box on there. Yes, you may recycle greasy pizza boxes in New York City. Please be sure to remove the pizza from the box. That sounds silly to some people, but it is a real thing um, that I see happen. So take the pizza out of the box and then recycle a box only. Again, even if it's greasy. And then everything else currently in New York City goes in the trash. It's not one of those six materials. So it pains my heart to see compostable items on that slide. And so I'm gonna to talk to you for just a minute about compost. We do not process compost at Sims. If we receive organics at, at Sims where I work, that, that's a problem, that's, it happens and it's not great. Um, but I, I do wanna to talk to you about this portion of our waste stream. So in New York City for a while, we had this brown bin program. Maybe some of you had it at your home. Maybe you've seen these bins around the city. Maybe you've used them in some form, great. We were able to put any food scrap, any bit of food soiled paper. So like paper that's really covered in food and probably shouldn't go in the paper recycling bin because it's so covered in food. You could even put plastics that are compostable. And just to be clear, Plastics are only compostable if they say on them, compostable. If they don't say it, they're not. I hope that that is, is clear. If it says biodegradable, not compostable. If it says bio-based, not compostable. It has to say compostable. That is the magic word. Um, so these brown bins could take all of these items. And then these contents, what we were putting in these brown bins were going to these huge industrial composting facilities that were outside of the city, but most of them were pretty close to the city. So, you know, always trying to cut down on, on transportation as well. But currently that brown bin program is on pause. Um, the, it's, it was an expensive program and you know, the city's budget is hurting as, as many cities and many budgets are, are hurting. So this program is on pause, but it will be back. So I encourage you all to remember the brown bin and use it. And if you live by a community garden, many community gardens are still accepting some compostable items. You just have to collect your compost and take it to that location. But I really encourage you to do that because just real quick pie chart, because this is a pie chart of all the waste we create in New York City and how it breaks down. And I just want to point out that a third of it could be composted. One third of all the waste we create is compostable. And then another third of it is recyclable in the blue and green bin. So there's a huge potential for diverting waste from landfills or incinerators, which is where our trash is headed. 
Um, it's just a huge potential to divert waste from being wasted, essentially, and put it to, to use. So that's what goes where. If you are ever confused, I encourage you to check your municipality's website. Okay, in New York City, the website is nyc.gov slash sanitation. I'm a trash nerd, but I find it to be a really fun website with a lot of great information. Right on the homepage, there's this search bar where you can put it, you know, it says, how do I get rid of? And you just type in the thing and it will tell you. And if you type in something and it doesn't tell you, please email me because I help them keep that search bar populated. But it's it's coming along. It's it's doing pretty well. Um, and you know, if you're not in New York City, I encourage you to check your municipality's local website because I'm really for this. When in doubt, find out. You know, people used to say, "When in doubt, throw it out," and I say, "No, no, just look it up." You know, we know how to use the internet. Use the internet. Look it up. Find out where it goes. Okay, now we get to the really good stuff. That was all the important information I have to put into your brains. And now I can show you what's next. So at this point in the tour, we would walk from this part of our facility where our visitor center is and our admin offices across this pedestrian walkway into our tipping floor. So remember that was the very large building with the solar panels on the roof. So this is us, we're walking over the bridge. We have this great view of Manhattan in the background. This is Gowanus Bay over here, Ikea. All the kids always notice Ikea. Jersey City is over here. You can see the Statue of Liberty, like she's very small, but she's right there. And then the upper bay. And then we walk into the tipping floor. And then I'll turn some sound on. Then you start to hear as you walk across some of the kind of crunching and falling sound. And then like right about here, you start to smell this very unique smell. A lot of kids say it smells like thistle. That's the most common reaction I get. And then you see this of the And again, this stuff has come to us from all over New York City. And this is where it waits on the tipping floor for processing. So all that material came to us either on a truck. So these are the DSNY, Department of Sanitation of New York trucks that go around, they collect recyclables from homes, from schools. And if they collect them in Brooklyn, close to our facility, they'll just drive right to us. But if you'll remember, if they're collected, recyclables are collected from the Bronx, Upper Manhattan, farther away, then they'll be loaded onto a barge and the barge will be pushed down the East River by a tugboat and come to us that way. So trucks and barges. The city runs the trucks, Sims runs the barges. And then again, it all ends up here on the tipping floor. I'll give you a little sound, this one's louder. So I like to give the sound there because it's a big part of when, when you look at this in person, it is so loud in this room. Uh, I have to yell for people to hear me. And of course, people always have big questions in this room. So what we're seeing here, this green crane or claw is scooping recyclables off a barge and then tossing them onto the pile. And then this yellow front end loader mixes the recyclables around, right? We don't want the same thing sitting on the bottom of the pile for days and days. And then the front end loader will push materials as it's doing here into the sorting system. Yes, it's a big pile. But if you look closer at the pile, you'll see there are actually two. There are two piles because remember in New York City, we separated our recyclables into two bins. So we have a pile for the MGPC, metal, glass, plastic, and cartons. That's the bigger pile because we receive all of New York City's MGPC, metal, glass, plastic, cartons. We also receive some of the paper. About 50% of New York City's recycled paper comes to us. The other 50% is collected by the city and they send it directly to the paper mill. We're sort of like an area where the paper can be consolidated and then go from a bunch of little trucks to one much larger truck. Again, cutting down on truck traffic. So we will load the paper onto one of these large trucks and that large truck will head to the paper mill. And much of our recycled paper here in New York City goes to a paper mill on Staten Island called Pratt. At Pratt, 
they, oh, it's a really big paper mill. So they dump our paper into this gigantic pulper, it's called. This isn't actually the pulper. I couldn't take a picture of it. This is the, um, it's kind of like a holding tank for, for extra pulp. Um, but the paper ends up looking like this, very appetizing, very weird smell that I don't even know how to describe. It's super duper weird. But after this, they will process the paper. They will screen out contaminants like staples and tape or you know the little plastic on envelope windows so like anything that is not paper that was in the paper stream gets screened out in their process and then eventually they get these giant rolls of new paper and these rolls are about as big as a small car you know maybe as big as a mini cooper huge uh, and they'll be sold to paper processors However, some of the paper stays there. They also have a box making plant and they are making pizza boxes out of New York City's recycled paper right on Staten Island. But that's just the paper. We still need to sort the metal, glass, plastic, and cartons, the blue bin. And this is the system we use to sort. So I will show you how it works and what's going on in there. But just as we look at this, um, I just want you to know this is two and a half miles of conveyor belts if they were stretched from end to end. It takes about 33 people to operate this system. It is operating three shifts every day, um, three eight hour shifts a day. And it is operating five days a week. So all through the night, five days a week, sometimes six days a week if we have a large influx of materials. Uh, and within that though, there are two shifts a week that are just devoted to cleaning and maintenance, right? Untangling all the plastic bags that people send to us that get stuck in the system um, or doing general maintenance. So this is it in person. And this is what it sounds like, sound coming. all the twisting and turning conveyor belts. There are many layers. There's about four levels. Um, and it's very much built like, it's built like New York City. You know, it's built up and not out. Everything is very, very compact and complex. So here are the steps. First step, we need to load the system. So the front end loader pushes recyclables into the entry point. This right here is the entry point. Now our view is going to flip. And we can see after the recyclables are pushed in, they travel up this conveyor belt here. You can see a bunch of things falling back and that is intentional. That just keeps a steady flow of materials. It keeps from overloading the system. So our view will flip again and we will see the first piece of technology, the liberator, very serious. So the liberator we have because of these. In New York City, residents are asked to leave their recyclables out in clear or see-through bags. If you are outside of New York City, there is a good chance that you are supposed to leave your recyclables out with no bag. Many places say we will not collect your recyclables if you leave them in a bag, so make sure you know. But in New York City, look, we just don't have space for large sealable bins to hold everyone's recyclables on collection day. So to contain the materials uh, and to have a way to set them out for collection, generally most people do use uh, the clear bags. If you have a sealable bin, you are certainly allowed to use that in New York City, but many buildings just aren't able to do that. So the Liberator is a slow speed shredder that just rips the bag open. That's it. So we're going to zoom in. The slow speed shredder is right in here and it just rips open the bags, liberating the recyclables, everything, the shreds of bag and the materials fall onto this conveyor belt here and then go into that big crazy system that we saw a moment ago. So after heading into the system, first step is disc screens. This is how we pull out the glass. So these metal rods all in a row spin. As they spin, materials roll over the top. So you see a lot of plastic. There's some metal in there passing over. There are so many plastic bags that I'll say it again should not be there, but people love to put plastic bags in their recycling bin. Please don't. It's really helpful if you don't. Um, but what's happening 
glass items hit the metal rods and break into small pieces if they haven't already broken. Those small pieces fall through openings in between the disc screens. So we screen them out essentially. Then there is another conveyor belt below to catch all that stuff and take it out the back. So it's a great way to pull out the glass. Problem is it's gonna pull out everything that's less than about two inches in two dimensions. All of that stuff is headed to another sorting facility, a glass plant, where we will remove metals. Those are easy to sort out. Magnets, reverse magnets, you're going to see more of that in a moment. But plastics, small plastics are very difficult to sort from the glass stream. It's very expensive. And most places do not do it because, you know, you could put in the technology to do it but then no one really wants to buy all those tiny little pieces of mixed plastic. So generally all those small plastics, not just at our facility, but at MRFs in general, they will end up as trash. So one little thing you can do, uh, leave plastic caps on plastic bottles. Plastic stays with plastic. And that goes with cartons as well. You can leave the little plastic screw top on the carton. All right, so that is glass for metals pretty simple. We have a giant spinning drum with a powerful magnet inside, attracts all the ferrous metal and drops it onto another conveyor belt here. But for the non-magnetic metal, we have an eddy current. You can see items sort of being ejected and flying over this barrier onto this conveyor belt. Soda cans, aluminum foil, other non-ferrous metals, they hit the eddy current. It operates like a reverse magnet and repels them really neat to watch inanimate objects like fly through the air. I, I think I enjoy watching the eddy current. So that's glass and metal. Next, plastic and cartons. So to sort plastic and cartons, we use optical scanners. So these are like very fancy cameras. Materials fly by on the conveyor belt and pass under this line of light. That is the scanner. So the optical scanners, they are using near infrared light to identify the chemical makeup of the materials that fly by on the conveyor belt. So we have 16 of these optical scanners and that's a lot. Remember, we're the biggest MRF. Many MRFs might have one or two of these. Some might have a few if they're on the larger side, but we have 16 of them. And that's one reason that in New York City, we can say, yeah, put all rigid plastic in the bin. It's okay. We, we can sort the, the valuable stuff from the less valuable stuff. We have all these fancy scanners. So we set the scanners to look for different materials. When it finds what it's looking for, it turns on a jet of air at the end of the conveyor that goes pew, 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 pew. The jet of air shoots the recyclable through the air onto another conveyor belt. It's, and it happens so fast. Um, you can kind of see here. So this line of light is the scanner and then the end with the air jet is right there. And then some things shoot up and over, other things just fall down. So I will also say to compare us to other MRFs, you know, for us, humans come at the very end. Humans just do a final check after the technology. But at other smaller MRFs, humans might do a bit more. If a MRF doesn't have any optical scanners, that job is gonna fall onto human hands. Um, I will say also some larger MRFs are using robotics now to do some of the sorting, maybe of plastics or, or even of pulling out contaminants. Um, that is becoming a bit more common, uh, but we aren't currently using robotics at our facility, partly because we have so many optical scanners that are really taking care of a lot for us. But last step for us humans, do a final check, pulling out anything that does not belong, anything that is in the wrong place, putting it in the right place. They'll have a lot of different shoots around them so they can drop this item here or this item there, or aluminum here, things that we want to recover and, and not lose into the wrong stream. And then once materials have been sorted, they dump into one of our bunkers. It's like a holding area. When the bunker is full, the front door will open as you see happening here and recyclables spill out. So this is a bunker of PET, soda bottles and water bottles. This type of plastic is called PET. And boy, when that bunker opens, a lot comes out. It is just so, we receive so much of this stuff. You can probably imagine at our facility. So then, this is no longer PET, this is now HDPE plastic, uh, jugs, milk jugs, water jugs. 
So after the bunker, materials are fed to the baler and they are compressed. And this is what we make at our facility. MRFs sort and make bales. And we do make a variety of bales. These are just a few of them. These are the plastic bales that we make. There's PET plastic, soda bottles, water bottles. HDPE natural jugs that are not dyed a color. HDPE color jugs that are dyed a color. And then PP or polypropylene plastic. That's things like yogurt cups and to-go containers, butter tubs and the like. And then of course, tin are ferrous bales and aluminum are non-ferrous bales. And just, just to make it clear, this is a volatile market. So these materials have different values and those values can change depending on many factors. And also do keep in mind, we're competing with raw materials. You know, and right now the industry is in a really interesting spot where actually values, um, of materials have gone up and the cost of virgin material has also gone up. So it's a bit more of a level playing field right now. And it's sort of like we're in a nice place and no one expects it to last, but I think we're real we're happy right now, for now. So then materials or the bales, I should say, leave our facility. They go on to the next step in the process. Our tin can bales leave by rail car and then many of our other bales leave on trucks. So this forklift is just loading bales right onto the truck. Um, materials like glass and bulky metal, we can't bale those materials. They will go outbound on barges. So these bales are headed on to the next step. Remember the smelter or reclaimer or mill and then the brand or manufacturer that will make them into a new product. So that water bottle that you recycled, after we sort it and sell it, it's going to a plastic reclaimer. They're gonna chop it up into flakes. They are going to wash and sanitize those flakes, don't worry. And then they will melt them into pellets. Those pellets, it's usually the pellet, sometimes it's the flake that's sold, but usually it's a pellet that is then sold to a manufacturer and can be used to make maybe more water bottles, but more likely, this PET plastic will be used to make clothing or textiles or carpeting. That's a very common uh, next step for water bottles. So look, that's not a perfect circle, right? How many ways do you know to recycle a carpet? They exist, have you heard of them? I don't know where they are and I know a lot about recycling. So that, that is one maybe downside to that, but the upside that I do like to point out is, you know, this water bottle, how long is that going to be in use for? 10 minutes, one hour? This carpet hopefully will be in use for years. Um, so again, I, I do like to look at as many sides of the story as, as possible. So that carton that you recycled. Cartons, if you remember, they are paper coated in plastic. So what is going to be recovered is actually that paper. It's soft, it's white, it was protected by those layers of plastic, it's looking very pretty. It's probably going to be used to make toilet paper. That's often what that paper is used to make or possibly writing paper. Metal, metal can be recycled endlessly as a very strong, very versatile material. It will be smelted and can be used to make, you know, a variety of metal products, whatever is made out of that same type of metal, you know? So yeah, a little soup can could be a part of a steel beam potentially uh, to make a, a building or a bridge even. And then clear glass will be sent probably to a furnace, to a glass furnace, a clear glass bottle or jar will likely go into another glass bottle or jar. One challenge with both glass and plastic is there's not currently a way to remove dye, to remove color. So once you dye glass a color, you're stuck. So that limits what it can become next. Similar with plastic. Once you dye it a color, it's stuck. So probably all, if you remember all those colorful like laundry detergent jugs that we had bales of, probably those will be mixed together form a black plastic. And much of that is actually used to make uh, like irrigation or drainage pipes. If you ever see those large black drainage pipes that are um, often, oh, they, they used to be metal and now the, they're often being replaced with these HDPE plastic pipes. So that is the journey of recycling. But I see there are lots of questions. So I'm glad I'm almost done so I can hopefully get to them all. I really like to put it in perspective. 
my job is to teach people about recycling. I get very excited. I'm very passionate about recycling and trash in general, but I want you to see where recycling falls on this waste hierarchy, right? Most favored options for managing our waste. Recycling is only halfway up. Yeah, it's better than trash. It's better than landfill or incineration, this recovery option that's incineration or burning our trash and then recovering energy from it. But recycling is only above that. Recycling is good. Recycling is helpful. I want you all to recycle and recycle right. But I want you to know that reduction and reuse are actually far more impactful. I bet you already knew this, but I have to make sure. We, if we really want to make big differences, it's about reducing the waste that we create, often by going for the reusable option, you know, by not just getting the reusable water bottle and the reusable shopping bag, do both of those things, definitely, but also buying things that will last, buying things that you can refill, repair, replace parts, refurbish, all those other great R's, and refusing the things you don't need or refusing the single use items when possible. So that is what I have for you. And now we can get into some questions. That was amazing. Do you want to read some of the ones off? There was a ton in the chat. Some of them you hit as you went through, but there's definitely yes. a lot. This happens. All right. So I will go from the beginning. And if I already hit it. Um, all right. Stephanie wants the numbers. All right. I will give them to you. OK, so in New York City, on the residential side, so what's collected by the Department of Sanitation, we generate 12,000 tons of waste every single day. That is equal to about 1,000 large yellow school buses every day. That's all the waste we generate. You're shocked now, I'm gonna keep going, you asked for it. So that's on the residential side. Remember commercial waste is collected by other companies. And that is a little bit harder to track. There's a little bit less um, official tracking going on there, but that is roughly another 12,000 tons a day. It's a lot. And then I'm so sorry, <laughs> but there's also construction and demolition waste. And that is a huge, huge category in the city. You know, things are being torn down, things are being rebuilt, things are being remodeled. That's roughly maybe another 12,000 to 24 thousand tons a day of construction and demolition waste. Um, so it is it is a lot. Uh, and if we want to tackle this problem, we must do so from all angles. So don't overlook our personal responsibilities. Don't overlook the responsibilities of, you know, manufacturers and, and corporations and the city. E everyone must play a part. You know, if you remember that loop I showed you, everyone in that loop must play a part. Uh, everyone involved in, in materials, in the generation and use of materials and disposal of materials must play a part. Um, one more number I will, I will tell you. So about, um, again, about a third of our waste is recyclable in the blue and green bin. And currently we are recycling about half of what we could. So New Yorkers are putting about 50% of what they could in the correct bin. So there's another, you know, 2000, there's 2000 tons a day that gets recovered. Um, a thousand is paper, a thousand is metal glass plastic. And then there's another 2000 tons of recyclables that end up going to, to waste, to landfills or incinerators. Well, there are the numbers. Uh, someone is from New Jersey, great. Um, more bottles and jars. Yes, you were right, Stephanie. Um, candle glasses, uh, yeah. So like candle holders, I think you mean. I mean, really, if it's, if it's not a, Ooh. like these and they're really annoying because I, I love candles I but I, I've stopped buying because I just end up with these glasses and then I don't know what to do with them and I would assume that that's heat resistant so you can't I, I don't I honestly don't know for sure because it looks kind of like a jar but if it has a candle in it that's meant you know to be on fire I would assume it's some sort of heat resistant glass so it's probably trash um sadly okay. thanks yeah um, same question. Okay, great. How do we know which programs are in our areas or do we just recycle everything accordingly and the program will handle what they accept? So um, 
what I went over today is valid for everywhere in New York City. Every borough in New York City recycles this way, the same way. Um, if you're outside of New York City, you know, start by looking up, uh, if you're in a large town or another large city, look up your city's website. Or if you're in a small town, look up your county's website. Um, they should have a page for waste and recycling. If they don't, email someone and be like, what gives? You need a page for waste and recycling. Um, but most areas will because they want you to get it right because it actually costs them money. It costs your locality money if you are putting the wrong thing in the wrong bin. Um, so I do encourage you all to, you know, your homework is to look up your local program if you're not in New York City. And, you know, be empowered with that information. When in doubt, find out. Um, oftentimes I see it's only grocery shopping, plastic bags. Does that include soft plastic like the Amazon? Yes, all soft plastic should not be placed in your recycling bin anywhere in this country. Sorry, my heater is going tick, tick, tick in the background. Um, but that includes all bags, pouches, wrappers, mailing envelopes, none of those things should be in your home recycling bin. And this gets confusing because these mailers, they have this symbol on them. Maybe some of you have seen this. This is the how to recycle label. So there's a little recycle symbol on it, right? But look, you must always read because inside it says store drop off only. So that, these are store drop off only. They don't go in your home recycling bin. Again, anywhere in this country, some other countries you can't, but anywhere in the States you can't. Um, do plastic and glass recyclables need to be cleaned? Okay, great, the, clean, the cleanliness question. So in New York City, Recyclables don't have to be perfectly clean. Uh, it generally, it is good practice to clean your recyclables, um, but in our city, we don't need them 100% clean. However, it can be problematic if we get things and they're like a quarter full or half full because that adds weight. And remember, we're using an air jet to eject this. So if it's too heavy, the air jet might not be able to shoot it. So a little bit of residue is okay, um, but don't, give, don't send us things that are full. Uh, and when you it kind of goes into that, is it bad to um, crinkle it up to like condense things if you're trying to use it, to shoot them and do all these other methods? Is it hard for it to read that or does it matter? Generally, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it shouldn't matter. You don't go nuts with the flattening, <laughs> but you can flatten it a, a little bit. It's It should be fine. It's hard to give a surefire what will happen every time answer, but that's why we have humans, you know, do at the final end of it, as the final step in our sorting. All right. Um, and I do like to say about cleanliness, don't waste water when you're cleaning your recyclables. For that peanut butter jar, just like let it soak overnight in water and then just put it in, it's fine. Uh, anyone know we how we can petition to bring back organics collection? Okay, so look up uh, the Save Our Compost Coalition, hashtag Save Our Compost. Um, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of activism happening uh, through that. Save Our Compost is the New York City group that is, um, that is working on, on getting that. Even if we don't get those brown bins back, um, they are working on expanding drop-off locations as well. So they're really trying to hit that problem from all angles. And realistically, you know, because that, Brown bin program is expensive. And so I really don't know when the city is going to be able to commit to that again. Now they're saying you're right, 2022. But in the meantime, you know, the city is trying to get more of these drop off points. So it's more convenient for people to participate in, in any way that they can. Uh, drop off sites are back. Yep, yep. Community gardens, yes. Um, are the bags recycled? So, um, the clear recycling bags that New Yorkers are to leave their recyclables out within. Um, we do sort them. We do bail them up with other plastic bags that we receive that we shouldn't. Uh, and we try to sell them. And we have been able to on some occasions. The problem is they're very dirty after they've been through our sorting process. So that lowers their value um, and lowers the ability for them to be reprocessed. And they get mixed with um, plastic bags that are multi-layered. 
So like, think of like plastic pouches that hold foods, right? Usually they're not made of just one type of plastic. They're different types of plastic, little tiny layers of it fused together. So those make their way into those plastic bales and they are a contaminant. They, they make it very difficult for us to sell um, our bales of plastic bags, sadly. Uh, it's something we will continue to, to work on to try to sell, um, but usually, those plastic bales end up as waste, unfortunately. Those soft plastic, plastic bag bales will end up as waste. Insane, so cool, I agree. <laughs> Whatever I was talking about when you put that in. Um, hardest part uh, is supermarkets wrap everything in plastic. Um, yeah, yeah, a lot of things are, are being encased in plastic, you know, and there are also, you know, plastic free movements where people are trying to cut plastic out of their lives in any way possible. Um, there is the Beyond Plastic uh, group that they're doing a lot of activism uh, on that. Um, there is the, the Story of Stuff group. They just put out a, a documentary called The Story of Plastic, really depressing, but really eye opening, um, interesting stuff to check out. Um, what recycled items do we sell the most of? Um, probably plastics, um, probably plastic uh, in volume. Um, I believe it is plastic. In weight, uh, glass is, is the most of what we receive because glass is a very heavy material and sadly doesn't have a very large value. Glass is really challenging to recycle partly because it's so heavy, it's expensive to transport it. So you end up with you know, high transportation fees and you really can't send it very far. So recycling programs, including glass really depends on, you know, is there a facility in my vicinity that will buy this glass? Because if there's not, they might not be able to even accept glass in their program. It's, it's sad because glass can be recycled endlessly. Uh, and it's really, it's a, it's a precious material, I, I think, but challenging, unfortunately. Um, there were news stories that the recycling market has dropped out. Is that true? So um, while I can't speak for every facility, I can say in general, um, a couple of years ago, two and a half, three and a half, wow, uh, January of 2018, uh, there was something called the Chinese National Sword which was when the Chinese government said, nope, we will no longer import a lot of recyclables. This came after decades of many recyclables being sold to China. Many, many recyclables were being sold into companies in, in China. And then China said, look, we're getting a lot of trash. We can't handle all of this stuff. You're sending us junk, no more. They closed the doors. So that caused a lot of ripples in the recycling industry, not just in our country, but in many countries that were selling to China. That was a little, that was a while ago and things have changed since then. Now there's a lot more capacity to process these things in this country or in Canada, uh, or maybe some even in Mexico. Um, so it's balanced out a little. And unfortunately, other countries in Asia ended up you know, importing more after China closed their doors. But more domestic, a more potential to process domestic has helped a lot. Um, so wh while there may be areas, especially now during the pandemic, then that you know, caused a slew of new problems. Um, but if you're hearing stories about, oh my gosh, like all of Philadelphia's recyclables are going to landfill, that was happening for a time, but it was happening for a time. And then Philadelphia figured it out. Uh, and you know, maybe they might have to send some to landfill for some period of time, but that these things happen for periods of time and then they get worked out. Please keep recycling. It's not all going to the same place. It's not all ending up in the trash. Um, please, please, please. In Greenwich, uh, we, your single stream, great. Uh, I've heard that the market for recyclables has crashed because of contamination. Um, China, our largest buyer. I wonder if Connecticut was selling to China. Maybe they were. I, a lot of East Coast facilities were not um, because it's not exactly accessible. It's much far. It's much easier for West Coast um, because of shipping containers going um, back and forth across the Pacific. Um, seems like the only solution is going back to more separation. Yeah, and you know, since that whole Chinese national sword thing, a lot of recycling programs got a lot stricter uh, about this is what we can accept. Stop sending us trash. We can only take these certain items that have a sure market. Um, so yeah, the, things have changed quite a bit since then. And, and I would say a lot of solutions have come into play. Um, 
doesn't sound like Sims has a contamination issue. Oh, we do. We just contamination is it's gone up during COVID as well. Um, we're able to sort it out, but you know, we make bales of trash. We make bales of things that never should have come to us. And then we pay to send it to landfill or sometimes incineration. Um, but you know, when you put trash in your recycling bin, it's just like going on a really expensive double journey to the landfill, essentially. It's going through this whole extra step when it's just headed to, still headed to the landfill. Um, so if you're not adding for the content, mention that there are programs to take soft plastics. Yes, Walmart, Stop and Shop, Bed, Bed, Bath and Beyond. Found those in-store programs. Uh, oftentimes I see that it's only grocery shopping plastic bags. Um, does that include being able to bring soft plastics? Yes. You, in those drop-off points for soft plastics, you can bring generally any soft plastic bag that is stretchy that if you can put your two thumbs in it and press it will stretch if it's firmer like a lot of like pouches like food pouches like with the ziplocs with i don't know like nuts or berry or whatever uh if it is a bit firmer and rips like paper then it's a different type of plastic and you can't bring it there but all the stretchy ones like bags bread bags newspaper bags dry cleaning bags um shopping bags those can and even the mailing envelopes those can be brought to those drop-off locations. But things like, like a chip bag, no. Different, very different type of plastic. Cannot include those. Um, uh, do you know what grocery stores do that? So you can, I, um, I'll pop this into the chat in a moment, but there is, and I'll also, because I know we're nearing the end, if I don't get to your question, do feel free to email me. Um, but plasticfilmrecycling.org. Um, is a way to find a drop-off location in your area for um, for plastic bags. Plastic film is another word or another way of describing plastic bags, soft plastics. Plastic film recycling, I think .org, .com. I don't, I don't remember. Either way, I'm sure you would find it. Um, how did Sims get involved with recycling? So um, Sims Limited is a very large company with many divisions. We handle electronic recycling, metal. We have a division for metal recycling. We have a division now for like recycling data and then for recovering energy from landfills. They do a lot. Sims Municipal Recycling is one division of that company. Um, and we actually got into municipal recycling here, you know, in this facility and in New York City. We put in our, uh, you know, we applied for the request for a proposal and we won. So we now process New York City's recycling. We have a public-private partnership with the city of New York. Oh, cool. I got to the end, right? Did I miss any? Timing, well done. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. Very impressive. Well, um, thank you so much, Kara, for the amazing, amazing and very informative uh, presentation and, for, and to Rebecca for helping out on the techn technical side as always. Um, just so you guys know, all of our events are listed on the PNWA's website under committees. You'll see green committees. So please go there, sign up for more events. We're going to continue to do presentations like today's. We have one for composting that we're um, trying to schedule, which will answer a little bit of more of where you can do that. Um, and then next up actually is another one of our movie nights. We have Kiss the Ground. It's a revolutionary group of activists, scientists, farmers, and politicians who have banded together in a global movement of um, regenerative agriculture that could balance our climate, replenish our vast water supplies and feed the world. So um, that is up next. And then we do Earth Day is coming up April 22nd. And so we will honor that with the trash pickup. So more information on all of those and how to register on the PNYU website. But um, thank you so much. That was great. I think everybody had a good time. Lots of great comments. Um, all of you have her email. So now you can ask any other questions that come up or that you encounter um, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, everyone. Take care, reduce, reuse, and then as a last resort, recycle. Yes.